My name is Dr. Jillian Jordan, and I'm a co-director of the Stan Creek Regional Archaeology Project. I received my PhD from the University of New Mexico, and I specialize in the compositional analysis of pottery, particularly thin section petrography. I have worked in many different regions of Belize in the United States, but most of the examples in this presentation will be from my research in Belize. In this lecture, we will go over how and why archaeologists use thin section petrography and two common methods for analysis. The quantitative point counting method is used widely in the Americas, and the qualitative descriptive system is used primarily in Europe. So what is thin section petrography? The technique was developed in the natural sciences, and analysts use what's called a polarizing light microscope to identify minerals in thin section. Archaeologists use petrography to understand how and where pottery was made. The process for making ceramic thin sections is very similar. We usually analyze rims because they provide information on chronology and vessel form that may be important to how we interpret the petrographic data. Ceramics are much more porous than rocks because they contain both clay and rock and mineral inclusions. The ceramics first need to be impregnated with a clear epoxy prior to mounting them on the slide so that they can be cut down to 30 microns thick. Then we analyze the slides using a petrographic microscope, similar to what was described in the video. There are a few ways to identify rocks and minerals in thin section, and they are different for plain polarized light and cross polarized light. For example, in the upper image, you can see a garnet that looks like it is sitting on top of the other minerals. This is because garnet has very high relief, which helps analysts to identify it. In the lower image, you can see an example of twinning in cross-polarized light called tartan twinning because it resembles Scottish pattern cloth. Tartan twinning is distinctive and is used to identify a type of feldspar called microcline. One thing that makes rock and mineral identification in ceramic thin sections more difficult is that we don't have the entire rock. We are most often tasked with identifying very small minerals under the microscope, which can make the analysis much more difficult. On the bright side, we can get pretty far if we know the optical properties of the eight rock forming minerals that are most commonly found in pottery. There are hundreds of different minerals, but they often do not end up in ceramic thin sections. The lower arrow points to a different type of feldspar than we saw in the previous slide called plagioclase. And you can identify it and distinguish it from microcline because it has a different type of twinning. This is what an entire ceramic rim shirt looks like in thin section. On the top, you can see the entire sample in plain polarized light, and on the bottom, you can see the sample in cross polarized light. In most cases, however, we are viewing a much smaller section of the ceramic underneath the microscope. There are two primary reasons that archaeologists analyze pottery using thin section petrography. We want to know where the vessel was produced so we can answer questions related to trade and exchange, for example. We also want to know how the vessel was produced, including the steps the potter took to make the vessels. This technique is relatively inexpensive compared to other compositional analytical techniques and can be performed using microscopes that are already available at your university. The first question we usually address is provenance. Modern potters can travel much farther for raw materials because they have vehicles, 
But ancient potters usually collected raw materials from close to their homes in order to limit energy expenditure associated with transporting heavy materials like clays, rocks, and wood used as fuel. Dean Arnold's comp compilation of ethnographic literature indicates that potters travel between 1 to 50 kilometers to acquire clay resources, though the preferred distance is 1 kilometer. 84% of the potters in his study acquired clay within a 7 kilometer range. This image shows a 1 kilometer and 5 kilometer range around major sites in the Belize River Valley to give you an idea about how far people would generally travel for raw materials. Because potters generally do not travel far for raw materials, the rock and mineral inclusions in the vessel provide important information on where the ceramic vessel was produced. This image shows different geologic regions of Belize. The green areas are limestone, the red and gray areas in the center are granites and quartzites, and the orange at the bottom is calcareous sandstone. The difference in these three broad geologic zones in Belize is very evident under the microscope. The top thin section shows a limestone tempered pot, the middle shows a granite tempered pot, and the bottom slide shows a calcareous limestone tempered vessel. You can also see that the pottery produced using these different raw materials looks different macroscopically as well. The basic pottery production process is similar in many parts of the world. Potters first need to collect their raw materials. These raw materials are then processed, the vessel is formed into the desired shape, then decorated and fired. Not all of these steps are required for every ceramic vessel, and the raw materials used in pottery production and the way that potters process, form, decorate, and fire pottery differs across the world and even within a single region. Potters can make a variety of choices, and many of these choices can be identified using thin section petrography. We will just discuss collecting clay and timber raw materials and identifying them in thin section. The first step in the pottery production process is to collect the raw material. Clay, water, and fuel are the basic raw materials required to make a ceramic vessel. Temper is not required, but is often added by potters. If vessels are decorated with a slip or paint, then those materials must also be acquired by potters. In this presentation, I'm just going to discuss clay and temper because these are the raw materials that are used to produce the vessel. Slip and paint are used as decorations applied to the surface of either fired or unfired vessels. Clay is abundant on the landscape. Anyone who's walked around after a rainstorm and had to remove sticky dirt from their shoes knows this very well. But what is it? Clays are sediments that form by the weathering of rocks. Clay particles are very small, they measure less than 0.002 millimeters in diameter, and their small size means that there is a lot of surface area relative to volume. Dry clay looks like a powder, seen in the lower left image, but when water is added, the clay particles stick to one another and can also slide by each other, providing a material that can be shaped into different forms when wet. Once the force used to shape the clay is removed, the clay will maintain its shape and heating the clay provides a hard, durable ceramic vessel. Clay comes in a variety of colors and textures with different physical properties. Clay in the landscape is generally not composed of only clay-sized particles, as seen in the image on the previous slide, but also contains larger particles like sand and pebbles. One way to determine how much clay is in the soil is to add water and form a ribbon. 
If the soil gets sticky when wet and you can form a ribbon, then the, clay, then the soil contains abundant clay. Even though a clay is abundant on the landscape, not all clays are suitable for pottery production. Potters select their clays based on physical properties like plasticity, taste, and feel, to name a few. The clay, often called the micromass in petrographic studies, is material that measures less than 0.01 millimeters, which includes both clay and fine silt sized particles. This is the material on the slide between the larger rock and mineral inclusions that the arrows are pointing to. Because clay particles are so small, you cannot see the individual particles under the microscope. The slide on the left shows a fired natural clay, and the slide on the right shows clay in a ceramic vessel. A similar clay to the one shown was used to make this ceramic vessel. However, I know that this exact clay was not used because it contains numerous iron inclusions, identified by those red circles, that are not present in the ceramic sample. Not all clays are ideal for making pots in their natural state, so potters will add materials, what archaeologists call temper, to the clay to improve its quality. The added materials serve a variety of purposes to make the clay more workable and suitable for pottery production. The most common tempers used in Belize, for example, are crushed rock and sand, but potters also use grog and hute shells. Potters in other regions will also use organic material like grasses and animal dung as temper. Most, but not all, of the ancient biopottery produced in Belize uses an added temper. Potters may have added temper to increase the strength of the clay, to decrease the stickiness, or to reduce shrinkage in the drying process. Analysts can identify temper under the microscope in a few ways. Sometimes the temper is from a different raw material than the clay. For example, a potter could use a crushed granite temper in a quartz sandy clay, so you could infer that the granite was added because it is of a different composition. Often the composition of the clay and the temper are the same. In this case, you could suggest the presence of an added temper based on a bimodal size distribution. The idea is that the added material is larger and irregularly distributed across the fabric, indicative of an added material. So on this slide on the left, you see a unimodal size distribution of carbonate sand. So this pot was likely produced by potters using a natural, naturally sanded clay without added temper, versus the vessel on the right, in which large angular limestone inclusions are bimodally distributed, suggesting that they were added to the already calcareous clay. It's always a good idea to collect and analyze locally available clay sources. Natural soils can also contain bimodal size distributions. This slide shows a ceramic sample from the Maya site of Alabama. We originally thought that this vessel was produced using granite temper. However, once we analyzed a local clay source, we realized that angular rock fragments were naturally bimodally distributed in different drainages at the site. Next, I will describe the two primary methods archaeologists use to record petrographic data.